little treat later. We're told that uh, how powerful a testimony can be. And you know, sometimes when you're sharing with people, maybe in scripture or something, you know, they may be a little argumentative about that, but people can't argue with a personal testimony. <laughs> it's kind of a one-sided conversation, isn't it? <laughs> And the Holy Spirit can really work through that greatly. Today we're going to look again at a text or some text in a chapter of Genesis. Genesis chapter 13. We're not going to get very far into the book of the scriptures this morning, but we're going to get to chapter 12 and verse 13. And here, looking at this text here, I'm just going to kind of lightly go over chapter 12. This is where... Um, God gives the invitation to a covenant to Abraham. And he tells Abraham to move from where he's been living his entire life at, at this point. And Abraham's father, Terah, decides that he's going to move with Abraham when he leaves. And... Um, and Haran, who, does anybody remember who Haran is? That was, um, wasn't Haran's, um, Abraham's brother? Oh, um, and, they, and they go to a city, they move, they come to the next city when they leave, their home place, the next city they, they come to, they stay close by, the name is also Haran. That was named after Abraham's brother. And they stay there until Terah, remember, Abraham's father dies, and he dies at the ripe old age of a 205. So he, I didn't ever remember that. Of course, some things are new to me, and I think I knew them before, but <laughs> apparently it must be slipping a little bit. Oh, um, so uh, he's, uh, he goes with them. Oh, um, so in Genesis chapter uh, 13 and verse 8, it says here, um, this here in chapter 13 is, starts out the separation of Abraham and Lot. And I'm just going to read this one verse and then we're going to back up and we'll get back to it later. But verse 8 it says, And Abram said unto Lot, Let there be no strife, I pray thee, between me and thee, and between my herdsmen and thy herdsmen, for we are brethren. So with, I'm going to change that word a little bit to a word that maybe we are a little more familiar with to quarreling. Let there be no more quarreling. So when you think of this word quarreling, what does that bring up in your mind? Disagreement. Huh? Disagreement. Disagreements. You know, it makes me think about your childhood days when maybe you were quarreling with your siblings. And... Um, so it brought back to my mind um, childhood things that you remember. And Corey and them was kind of laughing here a while back about these kind of things and oh, uh, about, oh, this is what dad says. And, uh, and so I started thinking about some of these little things that you remember, like money doesn't grow on <laughs> trees, okay? It says we're not trying to cool the house with the refrigerator, so shut the door. You know, <laughs> we're not trying to air condition the outside, so close the doors. And um, another one here that kind of gets towards quarreling, it says, uh, if you don't quit fighting, we're going to separate you. And I always kind of want to look around the room and make sure there was somebody more than just me because I didn't want them separating me, you know, like limbs. <laughs> <laughs> So, you know, we think about these things, but, you know, when you, so I think about children quarreling. Um, you know, I don't think that quarreling thing is dead, and I don't think any of us can honestly 
say that we're exempt from it. Okay. Oh, um, you know when children, oftentimes when they go to bed, and we may be guilty of this, when uh, they turn out the lights when they're little, um, they don't want the light turned off. Why? Because it gets dark. And I remember trying to reason with my children to say, but there's nothing in the dark that's not in the light. But they're convinced that there's these half human, half beast monsters that come out when the lights go off. And they're terrified of them. And after we try our best to convince them that there's no such thing, on the other hand, I think there really is monsters that are doing very live and very well, oftentimes in our own lives, that bring out this quarrelsome character. Yes. Oh, um, and even though Abraham took great care of his family life and how he managed that, doing the right thing can still bring out this monster. Oh, um, in verse 2, in verse chapter 13, it says, And Abraham was very rich in cattle and silver and in gold. Oh, um, and, and then, oh, uh, and, and he went, okay, in verse 3, And he went on his journey from south to Bethel unto the place where his tent had been at the beginning. And we're going to come back to that between Bethel and Ai. Oh, um, and let's back up here just a little bit here in chapter 12. And, oh, uh, and Abraham, when he leaves, and besides taking Terah, his father, with him, who else goes along? Who? Brother Lot, or nephew Lot, goes along with him, right? And um, so that's quite a herd of people. Because when you read here chapter 14, oh, um, remember when uh, uh, Lot gets, uh, he's in Sodom, and uh, he gets captured, and he's taken off, and Abraham goes to the rescue, oh, uh, Abraham chooses a number of people that it says were born into his household. This is help. And do you remember the number? It was uh, 318. <laughs> this is in the wrong order. Gary probably wouldn't like that. <laughs> this, those people that crunch numbers, they like them in the right order. So, so these households, I'm thinking, were, in a, a, were quite large and getting larger as time was on here. Oh, um, oh uh, so there was a great material wealth here along with a lot of people all traveling together. You know, I think moving has got to be really the pits because we've moved quite a bit when we first got married and um, around in the same place in Texas. And it was kind of the pits, but man, moving now would really be the pits. I mean, the, the house would probably not be quite so bad, but all my treasures that I have in the shops, no, man, oh, uh, <laughs> that would not be fun. <laughs> and the things that we think are so valuable if we die, the only moving the kids are going to do with most of it is probably in the dumpster, right? <laughs> or have some kind of sale. Because <laughs> people rent these storage buildings all the time. And, um, oh, uh, and uh, they have all their treasures in. And Anyway, oh, um, but you know, I was thinking about wealth. Wealth. Financial wealth. What does that equal? Pleasure? Probably. Satisfaction? Yeah. But what other things that can come with that? Maybe some frustration? Maybe some uh, feuding? Some quarreling? 
because I thought about, you know, can you remember back maybe when you were a child or maybe more clearly when you're a parent and your children are small and you buy something for somebody, one of the kids or something? Did you ever wish afterwards that maybe it, you ha wish you hadn't bought them because of the quarreling it causes? I can think of a swing set. I read a story one time about the, they saved up the parents and they bought this swing set and thought this was going to be such joy for the children, but it turned out to be quite a point of contention. It's my turn to swing. You swang first last time. And on and on we go. So even though we think wealth or material things would be a great blessing, oftentimes it turns out to be kind of the opposite. Because if all it takes is money, great wealth to make you happy, we need to be rational thinkers, amen? If that's what it takes to make you happy, how come the people in Hollywood, these stars, these mega rich people, how come these people aren't the happiest people on the face of the earth? How come they can't stay married? How come they cannot be happy? I mean, there's a few exceptions, but how come so many of them are so wrapped up in drugs and taking their own lives and, and their lives are just a mess? So it, you don't have to be much of a deep thinker to see that finances, having more money is the answer to your problems, that this would equal happiness. You know, um, the medical people, we're, we're, we're surrounded, of course I'm old fashioned, but we're surrounded with these acronyms, you know, these letters that mean things. And the medical people, they're just inundated with, I mean, just, they, they spout off these letters like you're supposed to know what that means, you know, like really. So um, I, uh, I, I'm not a marriage counselor, but I think we're going to shift just a little bit here. I think that most marriage troubles start the day after the wedding. <laughs> and I think I have the reason why here after I've been reading this story. And I call it UCL. Up close living. <laughs> UCL. I've never heard this. This is my own new acronym. You see, up close living. That's, did you have that on your phone, Neil? Up close living. Oh, um, because here's what the deal. When you go out on the date and you're you're dating Miss Wonderful or she's dating Prince Charming and everything's great, you know, it just you just love to look into her eyes and she looks into your handsome face and makes your world start spinning and then maybe it ends after appropriate time with a kiss and you go home. But guess what happens the day after you go mar get married? Nobody goes home. You're both home. Yeah, you're home together. And he doesn't live five miles down the road. He lives with you. You share the same bed. Don't you remember as kids? Did, haven't you ever had to share a, a bed with your brother or your sister? Two girls, two boys, because company came over and you had to be in the same bed? I don't want to sleep with him. But why not? He's your brother. I don't want him in my bed. And then the fight starts. His pajamas are touching my pajamas. Your knee is on my side of the bed. Why can't his bed be over there by the window? I mean, and it, so we learned this at an early age, how to quarrel. Hmm. Oh, um. <laughs> oh, uh, so we're not going home. We are home. So then we find out that Prince Charming or Miss Wonderful put marks on the mirror. Or the sink isn't quite tidy the way that you think it ought to be. Or maybe things are laying around just a little bit. And um, we start to see what we would call character flaws. And we begin to wonder, 
hmm, maybe I've married a pig. Huh. But you know what the problem is? UCL. It's, which is what? Up close living. <laughs> um, you know, we think it's kind of a little bit humorous, you know, when we're when we think back about our kids or maybe ourselves or the stupid things that we fight about. But you know when it's not funny? is when it comes into the family. And then it's really not funny when it comes into the church. And then it's even less funny when it comes into the ministry. This up close living. Oh, I can handle you five miles away. And maybe in the next room, or maybe in the same room, but after five minutes, you're pushing it. So the words, don't touch me, really mean I don't want you near me. I can tolerate you, but not up close. But the scriptures, though, when I look for the scriptures and these first texts and stuff, you know, um, I came to the, the conclusion that we are brought together in Christ. And we do not have the luxury of erasing that, that up close part. Hence, the sermon title no solo flights. You know what that means? No solo flights. That means none of us are flying solo to heaven. So if we don't get a grip on this, guess what? All the flights going to heaven are going to be flying in formation. That means it's not just you. So no solo flights. So we either be flying in formation, and I'm going to say it, it's not nice to hear, but we're not going to be flying. I think biblically that bears that out. Turn it, we're going to come back here to Genesis, but let's turn to um, Acts chapter 2. The book of the Acts, a friend of mine used to say. Acts chapter 2. Okay, Acts chapter 2 and verse 42 and onward. 2 and 42 and onward. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and prayers. And fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. And, they, and all that believed were together and had what? all things in common. And they sold their possessions and their goods and they parted them to all men as every man had need. And they continued daily with one accord in the temple, breaking bread from house to house and did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added unto the church daily as should be saved. Amen. Okay. So and as I read that and I pondered that, oh, you know what? I thought, Well, what if we don't even like eating with the saints? How are we ever going to share the same checkbook? Do you ever think about that? That's kind of a sobering thought. It was kind of my face. If I can't stand eating with the saints, because this is biblical here. This is when the people, after the Holy Spirit, right? If we can't stand even eating with the saints, because it's too much up close time, how are we going to share the same checkbook? Am I putting a spin on this, or is this what this says here? Amen. 
This is not just a single account. This comes up in the scriptures over and over again. I've come to the conclusion there's three P's. The three P's. And the first of the P's is proximity, which means up close. Okay. And we've talked about that a little bit. The second P, does anybody want to take a stab at what that is? We just mentioned it in this text here we just read. Possessions. Possessions. Hmm. Possessions. You know, there's, you ever heard the saying, less is more? Yes. Do you ever think about really what that means? Yes. Less is more? Yes. My grandfather, he was quite wealthy. Oh, um, he was born very poor, but he was quite the businessman. But he had a saying, he said, blessed be nothing. When evening comes, the chores are done. Yes, that's right. And he had a lot of things. Because the more that we have, guess what? The more that you have to take care of. Or <laughs> try to find help to take care of it for you. And those of us that are in the business world that <laughs> have to find help, <laughs> that can be quite challenging these days. <laughs> Trying to find good help is even more challenging. So, um, so material prosperity often hinders and divides relationships. This didn't only happen in the old days, right? Like we're reading about here. How many times have you heard, or maybe even been a part of, God forbid, that when somebody dies, possessions can cause great havoc in families? I can only think of one in my 61 years that I was up close enough to know, you know, what was going on, that this was not the case. How many times are relationships ruined between siblings or whatever? Sometimes it gets even more distant and um, because somebody didn't get the possession they wanted even if it was a vase or a cup or whatever. And the feud is on. And sometimes lasting for years, 20, 30 years, won't speak to each other again because of possessions. Hmm. You know, the scripture there, it says um, in Hebrews 13, 5, I learned a scripture song with the kids years ago. Is anybody familiar with that? Kathy? Be content. And it goes, be content with such things as you have. Be content with such things as you have. For he has said, I will never leave you, take you, be content with such things as you have. Now that's pretty easy to say, but how many of us can do that? Oh, I'm content, really. Being content. Well, when I have everything that I want, then I'll be content. It says we're supposed to be content with what you what? Yeah. Not what you're going to get, not what you hope to get, but what you have right now. And like we said earlier, apparently even the every people that have all these things, millions, they're not content. You know, in 1 Timothy 6, 6, it says, Godliness with, 
what? Contentment is what? Say it louder. Great gain. Godliness with contentment is great gain. So, hmm. So many of us are content because we lack some possessions. Many of us have the possessions, but we're not content with parting with them, like we read in Acts. So back to the three Ps. The first one was what? Proximity. The second one was? Possessions. And what do you think the third one is? P-R-I-D-E. Pride. There's a text, Proverbs 13, 10. It says, only by pride cometh contention. Isn't that interesting? Yes. Quarreling equals evil. It doesn't matter what kind of spin we put on it. Who's the father of it? My father had another saying. He said it takes two people to fight. He said one person cannot fight by themselves. But I've known people that can make a good stab at that. <laughs> but it takes two people to fight. Even though I think that is true, how many does it take to start a reconciliation? One. Only one. OK. So, um, you know, uh, in chapter, back in Genesis chapter 13, verse 8, oh, um, it says here, Abraham it says to Lot, says, let there be no what? No contention, no strife, no quarreling. I pray thee between me and thee and between thy herdmen and my herdmen. In verse 9, they part company. So let's go back just a little bit. Before Abraham is right here, oh, um, in Beth, between Bethel and Ai, remember he was at Bethel and Ai before he went into Egypt, and that's where God, they had the covenant, right? I will make of thee a great nation. Okay, so Abraham goes into Egypt, and at this point, he's came out of Egypt, and if he had a tail, it would be between his legs, correct? Because it did not go well in Egypt. Remember the beautiful wife thing? Oh, um, oh well, let's see here where I'm at. Oh, uh, So yeah, so then 12, he was starting his pilgrim's journey. So, um, oh, and verse, let's look here, back here on the, um, in chapter 12, we're bouncing back and forth between 12 and 13. It says chapter 12, let's see, and I believe it is verse, uh, do, 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 do here. Okay, no, verse eight, 12, verse eight. And he removed from thence into the mountains east of Bethel and pitched his tent having Bethel on the west and Hai on the west, east. And he built an altar to the Lord and called upon the name of the Lord. What do you think he was uh, saying when you call upon the name of the Lord? Did you ever think about that? How would that conversation go? When you call upon the Lord, how does that conversation go? Well, Lord, if you could do this for me, <laughs> and we treat, treat him like a, a sugar daddy or something. Well, you know, well, no, he was rich. He already had all that stuff, right? Okay. But we already read here where 
when you have all these things and you have all these employees and you have all this family and you have all that wealth, it can still cause great problems and challenges. So Abraham, he comes out of Egypt and he, God takes him back to the same place that he was before he fell in Egypt. Correct? And so he calls upon the Lord again. And, um, <laughs> and this time I can kind of imagine maybe what some of it went like when you call upon the Lord. I'm sorry, Lord. I did it again. But Abraham here in, um, in verse 8 and 13, he, he um, could you imagine when we read this here, oh, um, the verse 9, it says, Is not the whole land before thee? He's talking to Lot. Uh, um, separate thyself, I pray for me. If thou wilt take to the left hand, I will go to the right. If thou wilt go to the right, then I will go to the, to the left. So here's the herdsmen standing, Abraham's herdsmen's hundreds, lots, I don't know how many, standing around here in this, and they're thinking, well, I bet, oh, Abraham, Uncle Abraham is gone soft in the head. Because the way I read this story, Abraham is the senior here, correct? And I'm thinking Lot probably wouldn't have squat if it wasn't for Uncle Abraham. So what would have you done in this situation? What would I have done in this situation? Would, would we have said, um, Lot, where would you be without me? What would you have without me. Oh, no, we wouldn't use that. We'd say, uh, Lot, who's the covenant with? Would we have played that card? But what did Abraham do? Abraham goes the way of peace. He goes the way of peace. And he says, Lot, you take first choice. And Lot, with an eye for business, chooses all the fertile valleys. Because your, your sheep, your cows, your camels, they eat grass. And there's much more grass in the valley than there is on the mountain. So Lot moves forward. And we know how that story ends. Spirit of Prophecy says, Lot went in full, and he came out what? Empty. empty. And I mean really empty. His hesitation, we're told, causes his wife to turn back. So the only thing he left with was two daughters that got him drunk and raped him. So I would say that's pretty empty, wouldn't you? So who made the wise financial decision here? Do we use worldly wisdom? Or do we use heavenly wisdom? We have to ask for it, brothers and sisters, because we do not come up with it on our own. Abraham, the senior man who had everything, and Lot, which had nothing without Abraham. He chooses to be the peacemaker. The issue is, I don't have to feel like not quarreling. The issue is, do we choose to enter in or do we choose to be the peacemaker? Will it cost you something? Probably, but that's okay. Do we choose to make the Matthew 5 in the Beatitudes? It says, um, chapter 5, verse 9, it says, Blessed are the 
Peacemakers for what? For they shall be called who? The sons of God. That's the only ones that are going to be there. Are the peacemakers, the ones that want peace. But sometimes we go, well, wait a minute. People don't do me that way. No, I'm not letting him. That's not good. Let him get the, the better end of this deal here. No, there's no way. Was that a lopsided deal there? Abraham going to the mountain to look for grass for his, um, <laughs> somewhere else for his, and Lot takes the fertile valley. Abraham knew that, right? But he wasn't worried about it. We don't need to worry about always being on top. But we need to always worry about being the peacemakers. Amen. So my question is, are we peacemakers? Or are we smolders? You think, well, what is a smolder? When we get mad, are we one of them that goes into the bedroom for four and a half hours to smolder? <laughs> or are we one of them that blows off at the top for 20 minutes? Oh, are we one of them that, okay, how long can you take cold treatment? <laughs> you know, really, when we think about it, it's pretty pitiful, isn't it? Yeah. What does the scripture say? It says, all those who will live godly. How many? All. all those who will live godly will. Ooh, we don't like that next word. What's that next word? <laughs> Suffer. And we don't like the next word even less. What? Persecution. Persecution. Hmm. Abraham failed in Egypt, but he got it right here. Matthew 5, 23 says, still in the Mount of Blessings, it says, if you bring your gift to the altar or the church, I will put in there, and remember that your brother has ought against you, you're supposed to do what? Because it never gets better when we wait. It only just gets bigger in your mind and bigger in their mind. And pretty soon, people probably can't even really remember the facts. Because remember, there's always three sides to every story. Correct? Your side, my side, and the truth. Because we see things differently because of our backgrounds. Two, that's why two people can see the same event stand side by side, and they see it from a different perspective. Neither one is lying, but things seldom get better. So Abraham, let's have no strife between us. Amen. He was sensitive to what's right. No solo flights to heaven. We're all going how? Flying in formation. Worldly wisdom or heavenly wisdom? The choice is ours. Being right is not always right. But doing right is always right. Yeah. Because it is right. Amen. Blessed are the peacemakers. We'll have our closing song.
by faith on heaven's table land, a higher plane than I have found. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. My heart has no desire to stay where doubts arise and fears dismay. Some may dwell where these abound. My prayer, my aim is higher ground. Lord, lift me up and I shall stand. My faith on heaven's table land. A higher plane than I have found. Lord, plant my feet on higher Yeah.